Ladies and gentlemen, please forgive the out-of-order program, but one of our Washington Women of Excellence has to catch a flight because she's busy and has to keep it moving. We appreciate the time that she's given to us this evening, so we want to make sure that she's properly honored. So everyone, please welcome us um, in honoring Ms. Marie Johns for the Washington Women of Excellence Award for Leadership. I just want to apologize to everyone and to, um, to the mayor for having to leave the um, you know, schedules being as they are. I'm very sad, but I'm also happy that my family is here. My son will be accepting the award on my behalf when the program starts, and I'm very grateful for that. And my daughter-in-law and grandchildren are here as well. But uh, I'm very grateful for this. It means a lot to be recognized in the company of such other phenomenal women and organizations. And I want to thank Mayor Gray, I thank the Commission, and thank you, Therese, and your office for this wonderful honor. Thank you so much. And please pray for a safe flight. The weather's bad out there. <laughs> well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you so much for your patience on a stormy, rainy evening. Um, my name is Therese Lowry, and I proudly serve as Executive Director of the D.C. Commission for Women and the Mayor's Office on Women's Policy here in the district. Um, we thank you so much for attending this, our first annual Washington Women of Excellence Awards. This event is an integral part of the district celebration of March as Women's History Month and is sponsored by the Executive Office of Mayor Vincent C. Gray and the D.C. Commission for Women. The awards event intends to highlight the many significant contributions that women have made to our society, expanding our economy as entrepreneurs and business leaders, guiding our youth as parents and teachers, preserving our health as nurses, physicians, and scientists, creating new opportunities as advocates, philanthropists, and heads of nonprofit and community-based organizations, comprising nearly half of our workforce and the majority of students in colleges and university, and finally, serving at the highest levels of our government. Women have made these contributions despite real barriers like gender-based discrimination and historic inequities rooted deep in the cultural and political fabric of this nation. To address such inequities, the District of Columbia Commission for Women was established in 1967 to advise the mayor in developing strategies to enhance the status of women and girls. And through the efforts of organizations like the Commission for Women and of strong and determined women throughout our nation's history, tremendous progress has been made in the struggle for gender-based equality in access to education, fair compensation, and overall civil rights. The women and women's organizations honored here this evening has met, have made specific contributions to such progress here in the District of Columbia. They've shown ingenuity, intellectual and creative capacity, courage, character, and commitment to making a difference, especially in the areas of community service, leadership, workforce development, public safety, education, and public health. Through their work, all of tonight's honorees have improved the district's understanding of what women and girls can do and how much we can truly achieve when provided the necessary support and the opportunity to reach our full potential. This work is certainly worthy of celebration, and tonight we are here to do just that. Moderating this evening's event is Commission Chair Nona Richardson. Nona's done an excellent job in spearheading this organization and has done so with, with grace and strong presence and effective leadership, and I'm so glad to have her insight, her creative mind and energy, um, as well as her commitment as part of this commission. Nona recently launched her own soon-to-be enterprise, Mitch Rich Communications, where she serves as founder and chief strategist. She previously served as vice president of Widmeyer Communications and as director of communications alongside the great Josephine Baker, who's here tonight as well, on the district's public charter school board. Nona grew up in the district's public schools, as did several of our commission members, and she's here this evening to serve as our host of the Washington Women of Excellence Award. So please join me in welcoming DC Commission for Women Chair, Ms. Nona Richardson. Good evening. Thank you, for, Therese, for those kind, for the kind introduction. It is my honor and my privilege to serve 
as the chair of the, D of the DC Commission for Women. As a lifelong Washingtonian, I, I'm sorry, I can't see too well. I'm, I'm well aware of the contributions and impacts that women make in our communities and in this city, not to mention their contributions in the nation and in the world. Hold on to me just a sec. No, it's not. I'm not of a certain age. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I thought you had a microphone. I wish. I wish. Um, I'm very excited to be a part of this evening's celebration of Washington Women of Excellence. We have many great examples of such women in this room, in addition to the phenomenal women who are being honored this evening. On that note, I must acknowledge my own mother, Naomi Mitchell, who's here somewhere. Where are you, Mom? There she is. She has been, she continues to be, my mom continues to be a great guide and an example of empowered womanhood to me, as well as a longtime contributor to our city and, and her community. I'd also like to acknowledge my fellow commissioners in the room this evening. It's been my privilege to serve with women of so many impressive accomplishments and talents. Please raise your hands, ladies, so everyone can see who you are. You want to step in, step in, step in? And I must acknowledge Therese Lowry, our tireless executive director, who brought us all together. And Lisa Adams, is Lisa somewhere around here? There's Lisa, Lisa. She recently came on board with Therese and she has been, jumped right in with both feet and has been keeping up with Therese and supporting her and so we appreciate you as well. And I have to say, Therese worked with, with Mayor Gray while he was on the council, so she, I think, was impacted by or was influenced by his tireless, nonstop work ethic. So we are very uh, happy to have her as our, as our guide and supporter. Later, later during our reception, we hope that everyone here will meet each other, um, make new and lasting friends and colleagues uh, at the reception later this evening. The DC Commission for Women has a long legacy. It was established back in 1967, as Therese said, as the Commission on the Status of Women, as an organization that would inform and advocate to the city's leadership on behalf of issues of importance to women's, women and girls. During the previous administration, the Commission went unfunded and essentially defunct. Mayor Gray revived the organization back in the summer of 2007 and appointed 21 new commissioners to restart this important work. With no institutional records or baseline for our work, we spent the first year getting the commission back into operation, developing working relationships among new commissioners of various backgrounds, expertise, and talents researching the status of women and girls in Washington, D.C., the current status, deciding the priority issues on which to focus our efforts, acquiring in-depth knowledge of these issues, identifying allies and partners, and putting together a plan of action to support the ongoing development of women and girls in D.C. So we've been pretty busy, but along the way, we've been uh, active with support and leadership from Therese, lifting up issues, partnering with other organizations, and facilitating dialogue about issues of importance to women and girls in DC. We've established our mission to serve as a resource center, facilitator, and catalyst for planning and action to solve the problems facing women. We share a vision with the Office of Women's Policy that the standard of life for all women and their families will be characterized by fairness and equity and access to high quality education, employment, housing, health care, and public safety. Our priority issues are protection from violence against women and girls and elimination of human trafficking, the right to quality reproductive health, health care, and safe abortions, access to quality child care for working mothers, 
family-friendly workplaces, pay equity and living, wa living wages, excuse me, and the reduction and prevention of chronic diseases that disproportionately impact women. I'm sure we can all agree that when women are healthy, safe, empowered, and prosperous, so are our families, our communities, our cities, and our nation. We are excited about what we will accomplish in the near future and the groundwork we are laying to establish a formidable constituency of women who will be heard, who will lead, and who will make our city continuously better for generations to come. The concept of making our city greater is the perfect segue to my introdu introduction of our mayor, Mayor Vincent C. Gray. Mayor Gray, as I mentioned before, revived this commission. He sat down with us and to hear, to learn what we know and what we care about. He has demonstrated through the many policies and initiatives undertaken by his administration that he gets it. He's a very smart man. Throughout his, throughout his career, I'm going to tell you why. Throughout his career, he has surrounded himself with very competent, insightful women who have helped him to be a better public servant. At his State of the District address just yesterday, he talked about his support of many of the issues about which we care very deeply. Early childhood education, public education, workforce development, parental leave and family friendly workplaces, LGBT issues, health care, public safety, and affordable housing. Mayor Gray is not afraid to be a man in a room full of empowered Washington women because he is invested in knowing what is important to us and he will continue to hear our voices and make, make sound decisions for this city with our perspectives in mind. We are very pleased, Mayor Gray, that you were able and chose to be a part of this occasion during a very, very uh, busy time for you. Mayor Gray will personally hand each honoree their award and share a special proclamation later in the program. Before we get started, I'd like to invite him up to share his greetings with you. Please help me welcome Mayor Vincent C. Gray. Well, thank you very much, uh, Nona, for such a nice uh, introduction. I really uh, appreciate that. Um, as you heard, uh, the commission uh, was actually established uh, some time ago, uh, many years ago, several decades ago. And uh, when we got here, uh, we found out that um, it had essentially be, become dormant uh, by design, which is very sad because um, until we've resolved all the inequities facing women in the city and in this nation, I think there continues to be a need for a commission on women. And uh, in a great administration, there will always be a commission uh, on women. So thank you, Nona, for stepping up and, and taking on this responsibility. You know, we also had, uh, we also had uh, the office that supported uh, the commission on women. It was unfunded, uh, so there was no staff uh, either. And uh, I was just talking to, Reed, to Therese about the fact that um, the records, all the information was somehow... Um, commandeered, and uh, so they had nothing. Uh, but think of it this way. You all are the history now uh, of this organization, so, and you've certainly done a great job in helping to um, revitalize the organization. And Therese, I want to thank you. Therese, by the way, worked with me, as uh, Noni indicated, worked with me when I was the chair uh, of the council, and uh, I was delighted to, uh, have her, to have her appointed. I did appoint her. What am I talking about? <laughs> I point her as the uh, director of the Office uh, on Women's Policy. So, Therese, thank you very much for the good work that you've done. And I think the uh, size of the attendance tonight uh, is a testament uh, to the work that you've done, you know, working in tandem with uh, Nona to be able to lead this organization back to where it is uh, today. Um, you know, I met with the commission back, I think it was in December, and uh, we had a good uh, conversation uh, right here in the Wilson Building. And uh, we've tried to work on what I think are uh, issues that are gender-friendly and issues that reflect uh, gender equity uh, in the city. 
You know, 51% of our population in the District of Columbia uh, is, is female, uh, which means that uh, females are the majority. So if y'all want to take over the city, you obviously got an opportunity to do that. <laughs> um, I was pr pleased to announce a number of policies last night or proposed policy proposals that uh, I think will have a powerful, uh, powerfully positive impact on women uh, in the District of Columbia. And one of those was the parental leave uh, policy that I'm proposing. Uh, we were appalled, you know, to find that um, a, a woman, uh, in order to be able to have anything paid uh, during the time that she was giving birth and in the immediate aftermath, would have to have um, short-term disability uh, available, which is a policy that probably some people um, have. And as I tried to say last night, we should never refer to a child as a short-term disability because a child is a long-term asset to the District of Columbia. So, um, we're going to work to try to get that through. Uh, we're going to announce it uh, or introduce it, I should say, very shortly uh, into the council. And I think uh, in the advocacy role of the Commissioner on Women, uh, Nona and Therese, uh, bring all these folks together, uh, have them come down, uh, and make sure that there is a hearing uh, on this bill. And then when the hearing is convened, uh, make sure that you have a room full of people who are there to testify on why this is important. And don't let anybody fool you either. We figured out there really is no fiscal impact. Uh, on this. Somebody will tell you that, you know, maybe the city can't pay for this, uh, although I don't know who would try that one. Uh, but down here you never know what's going to happen. So I urge you all to step up uh, and, um, and make this happen because I think it's a good thing uh, for the uh, women uh, employees of the District of Columbia government. Um, you know, we looked at policies across the nation and uh, almost, I think we had 12 percent uh, of the states and, you know, other governments that actually have a policy like this, and the federal government doesn't have anything. So, as I urged last night, we, we urged the federal government to take a look at their policies. I think they will find there's a vacuum there, and also uh, private sector organizations. Uh, we've been a leader on a lot of things, and we want to be a leader uh, on this one as well. And I really am proud, by the way, of our early childhood education uh, programs. Um, we, And thank you for that, Jenny, because I know you know because you're running uh, an outstanding school uh, that is now has uh, pre-K-3 and pre-K-4. For those of you who don't know, uh, we have 70% of our three-year-olds uh, that are in school all day, every day, three-year-olds. Three year and 92% of our four-year-olds are in school all day, uh, every day. So um, I think we're going in the right direction. I proposed last night an additional investment in uh, infant and toddler uh, programs because I don't think there's a point, uh, a developmental point that is too early uh, to be able to intervene uh, with these children. Um, again, uh, many of you may know this, but 90% of brain development has already occurred by the time a child is five years of age. Yet our official school policy says send children to school at age five. So you're really foregoing for many families a developmental opportunity. It is one of the reasons why we have such an achievement gap uh, in the city and other cities across America, and that is there are some children who, who have an enriched um, you know, upbringing in their home, and they, are, they go to school ready to learn, and there are other children who may be equally talented but haven't had that uh, experience, and um, as a result, they wind, up with, uh, you know, they wind up behind before they even start. And that's one of the factors in the achievement gap. You know, we have people who stand up and talk, you know, they, they, they talk in topical sentences. There's no real depth uh, to it uh, about the achievement gap without really understanding why. What will solve the achievement gap over time will be the investments that we make at the earliest possible points uh, in these children. And frankly, you know who you get when you, when you, when you serve these kids at very early ages? You get their very young parents. Uh, which will equip them to be better uh, parents to make a better investment uh, in these children as they get older. You know, we, uh, our, our demographics suggest that we continue to have inequities uh, in the city. Uh, we have uh, the number of bachelor's degrees among women in the city is twice uh, what the national average is, yet we have 27% um, 
uh, of our women who uh, have no degree, no education beyond high school, which we know increasingly at this stage uh, is going to be a disability uh, for people just in terms of being able to qualify uh, for a job. Um, we have 90 to 95 percent of our women have health insurance, but our health outcomes don't reflect that. In fact, we now have, um, we have 93 percent of our adults in the District of Columbia have health care insurance with the second highest uh, level of coverage in America for, for adults. And for children, uh, we have 96 percent of children covered, and um, that is actually the highest uh, in the nation. But where we fall off is translating that investment into healthy outcomes uh, for our population. So we've got a lot of work to do. And by the way, we're getting ready to open. We, we've built now three new clinics uh, on the east end of the city during the time that we've been in office, and we're getting ready to open the third uh, of those in Bellevue uh, in Ward 8. We got a new one in Parkside, which opened in November, and then we built a new one in Anacostia that opened in May of uh, 2012. And again, we're trying to create a primary health care system um, that especially will serve young children and uh, women uh, who have uh, young children. Um, you look at our rates of HIV, uh, AIDS among women in the district, and it's disproportionately high, or they're disproportionately high. Um, female obesity, uh, our teen birth rates are still uh, higher than the national average, uh, and we've got some work uh, to be able to do. And we've got more work to do on the, on the advocacy front, too, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if you look at um, what happened, uh, I don't know how many of you all remember back in April of 2011, there were me and there was me and 40 other people uh, who protested what the Congress did uh, with our budget. We basically were bargained uh, away, uh, and uh, unfortunately bargained away by our uh, federal administration, in which we became a bargaining chip and trying to reach a budget deal. And uh, the deal was basically to say that, um, we w that they would permit a rider on the District of Columbia's budget that would not allow us to even use our own local funds for abortions uh, for women. Um, I think women's reproductive rights is one of the most important things uh, that can be fought for. Women ought to have a choice. And it shouldn't come down to the economics uh, in which uh, however much money you have uh, dictates uh, how much uh, you know, support you will get. That's why I'm glad that uh, you all are honoring the D.C. Abortion Fund uh, this evening, which has helped to fund uh, abortions for uh, women. But if we want to use our own local tax dollars for that, shouldn't we have the, the authority to be able to do that? Which um, you know, brings us to another uh, situation, and that is our own self-determination uh, here in the District of Columbia. You know, we've got to continue to wage the fight, fight, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, self-determination in this city, uh, because it really is absolutely ludicrous that we, should, we have to send our budget uh, up the street um, to the Congress to get permission. Uh, last time I looked, I don't think there are any uh, champions for uh, fiscal responsibility uh, up there, so why should they have the authority to approve our budget? You know, we have year after year uh, balanced budgets. We now have uh, one and three quarters billion dollars uh, in the bank. We pay 3.64 billion dollars a year uh, in federal taxes. Y'all remember the federal shutdown? <laughs> Wasn't that a travesty? I got a call. Uh, I got a call from the Office of Management and Budget. And they said, Mayor, we need your shutdown plan. I said, my shutdown plan? I said, yeah. I said, well, what are we shutting down? Well, you got to shut down the government because, you know, when co October 1st comes, um, you will have no approved budget. I said, well, how come I don't have an approved budget? This is our money. This is our property taxes, our sales taxes, our income taxes. So why should we be uh, shut down? And the answer was, well, the Congress has to approve your budget, and the Congress is <clears throat> the one that's forcing the government to shut down. I said, but we're not a federal agency. You know, we're not the National Park Service. We're not, uh, you know, the Commerce Department, which is right across the street, or the Interior Department, or any other federal agency. We are a, a jurisdiction that raises its own money and does a pretty doggone good job of supporting ourselves, okay? And, of course, that wasn't a very persuasive argument. So. <laughs> For those of you who 
know or don't know, I did submit a shutdown plan. And it said the following. Every, every function in the District of Columbia and every employee in the District of Columbia is essential, so we're not shutting down anything, you all. And we didn't. We didn't shut down anything. So, um, by the way, we were able to keep our doors open because we had a pretty robust bank account. We had a lot of money in the bank. Uh, when I got here, we had no discretionary dollars. We've added a billion dollars to our bank account during the last uh, three years, and that's one of the reasons why it's important. And there, by the way, there was a legislative victory out of that for those of you who don't know. And that was, right now in the budget, it says that in fiscal years 14 and 15, the district is exempt from any federal shutdown. And I think it will stay in the budget as we go forward. It just goes to show if you fight, man, if you stand up for your rights, you can actually win. Uh, any of you all remember the press conference that we held up on the Hill when the Senate Majority Leader and I had a, an interaction? <laughs> and you know, there were people who said, you know, you shouldn't have done that, blah, blah, blah. You don't get anything if you wait around for people to give it to you. Uh, and I think that's, that's so true of uh, the rights of uh, women uh, in this nation and certainly uh, in this city. Um, I want to commend you all for the work you all did to fight this bill, uh, H.R. 7, the uh, No Taxpayer Funding for Abortion uh, Act. And that was once again, to me, um, a, uh, you know, a, an incursion on the rights of uh, women in the District of Columbia. Again, why should, why should we be singled out? I don't think there, be, there should be such a law anywhere, to tell you the truth. But again, because we have no vote uh, in Congress, we are singled out for those kinds of actions. We have congressional representatives who will do things for the, to the District of Columbia that they wouldn't dare do uh, back in their own home districts because folks can get away with it uh, in doing that kind of stuff. So again, I want to thank you all uh, for what you're doing. I want to congratulate those who are uh, being uh, honored uh, tonight. Uh, Becky Lee, uh, who's one of our uh, honorees uh, tonight. Uh, Yasmin Arrington, Christine Brooks Cropper, who's one of the awardees uh, tonight, um, and uh, E.L. Haynes, uh, I guess, I don't know if it's a school or E.L. Haynes, the person which would be posthumously uh, awarded, but we have uh, Jenny Niles, who's here uh, as the outstanding uh, leader of that school, uh, who will accept the uh, award. And of course, the D.C. Abortion Fund, uh, one of the awardees, and Virginia McLaurin. 105 years old, man. <laughs> and I think you still volunteer every day, is that right, Virginia? Yeah. It's all right, man. Uh, you know, a lot of us won't make it that far. Uh, but I tell you what, if I were fortunate enough to make it that far, I hope I have, I have the same energy level uh, and same uh, acuity that you have. So thank you for being here tonight, and we're going to do something a little bit later uh, to mark your 105th uh, birthday. So uh, today, today, today. <laughs> That would be uh, Wednesday, March 12th. Wednesday, March 12th. That is fantastic. So again, we will come back uh, during the program and we'll do something to uh, make sure that we properly, uh, properly mark that. So I think I'm going to turn it back over to Nona uh, at this stage and we're going to uh, do the awards. Again, Nona, I want to thank you. Um, you know, you were a trooper at the, uh, you know, the Public Charter School Board. Now you're doing your own thing and I can't think of somebody who would be a better choice to lead uh, our Commission on Women, uh, re really especially to uh, rejuvenate it. By the way, for those of you who don't know, when we got here, there were seven, seven, it was 900 vacancies on boards and commissions uh, in the District of Columbia because I think they were just systematically trying to eliminate uh, those, the previous administration. And uh, we've, we've restored them. Um, we, uh, there were 30 or 35 that were really obsolete at that stage, not this one, of course. Um, and we've now repopulated all the boards and commissions that are rele relevant, and we're making appointments now as they come due. Uh, 
so we're not trying to play catch up uh, anymore. So again, um, Nona, thank you very much for your leadership uh, as chair of this group, and thank you for working with Therese to help restore the vitality of our Commission on Women. Come on back up. So now we get to get we get to get to the best part of this evening. It's time to honor some exceptional Washington women of excellence. Our committee, our commission, uh, women secretary, I'm sorry, our commission for women secretary, Crystal Espy, will do the honors of presenting our first award. Crystal is a graduate student in the Masters of Public Administration program at American University. She also serves as a state advocacy and legislative fellow at AARP. Crystal recently completed her undergraduate studies at American University with a double major in political science and women's gender and sexuality studies. She is currently, I'm sorry, she is with a, right, double sexuality, um, she has been one of our most active commissioners, managing to fit in commission activities while also going to school full time, working and being a leader on her campus. She is also the baby of our commission. She is the youngest. So we are especially proud to have her as part of our commission and I will bring her up now to represent the first award. Thank you, Nona. I feel especially privileged to be able to present the first Washington Women of Excellence Award this evening. I'm inspired by all of our honorees this evening, but as a recent college graduate and current graduate student, I am particularly inspired by Yasmeen Arrington. Yasmeen Arrington was born and raised here in Washington, D.C., mostly by her grandmother, who struggled to care for her and her brother most of their young lives, but especially after their mother died during Yasmin's freshman year of high school. Their father was physically absent from their lives due to incarceration. She valued that connection to her father and uh, came to understand through exchanging letters with him that most children don't get the opportunity to build any kind of relationship with their incarcerated parents. In addition, the trauma of separation the destabilizing impact being shifted between caregivers and the high likelihood of living in poverty before, during, and after their parents were incarcerated are devastating realities for children of incarcerated adults. Yasmin understood that because of her socioeconomic background, she would be marginalized by some and thought unable to succeed. But with respect for education that her mother instilled in her, encouragement from her grandmother, support and love from her teachers, church, and the community, Yasmin rose above her circumstances and continued to set the bar high for herself with far-reaching goals, including going to college. At 18, she was accepted to Elon University in Elon, North Carolina with a $30,000 scholarship from multiple organizations. Now at 21 years old, Yasmin is a junior at Elon University majoring in strategic communications and history. In 2010, Yasmin founded her nonprofit organization, Scholar Chips, which awards college scholarships to high school graduating seniors whose parents are incarcerated. Yasmin would certainly be celebrated simply for overcoming her own challenges, getting into and completing college and making a better life for herself. Yet, Yasmin took it upon herself to go several steps further, to support other young people like her who have intentions to live far beyond their childhood circumstances. In only two years, Scholarships has supported seven young people with such intentions and has raised over $40,000 in scholarship funds. Mm -hmm. Yasmin's mother and grandmother and all of the many people in her village who have supported her along her journey must be extremely proud of the young woman that she is becoming. The DC Commission for Women is certainly proud to recognize Yasmin as a wonderful example of women for the girls, for women and girls all across the city of what it is to achieve your own goals while also serving others in your community. 
Yasmin contributes to a long legacy of exceptional accomplishment and contribution by women who are products of this city. It is my privilege and my honor to present to you Yasmin Arrington, the Washington Women of Excellence Award and the category of community service. Congratulations, Yasmin. Thank you, Ms. Crystal. She basically said everything, so I don't need to say much else. <laughs> but um, I just want to thank the mayor. Thank you so much. And the DC Commission for Women, Ms. Lowry. Um, I want to thank all of my family and friends and scholarships um, who are here. Um, just very briefly, yeah, scholarships is, is a part of my story. It's, it's a part of who I am, so it's very important to me. Um, in 2012, I started in 2010, my first year in high school. I was in a program called Learn Server International, also a Washington, D.C. nonprofit that teaches about entrepreneurship and leadership. Um, and there I was able to develop my idea uh, with the help of my grandmother. And in 2010, it started. 2012, we gave out our first scholarships. 2013, we were able to renew those um, and also bring on a new cohort of students. Uh, and more importantly, the United States has the highest population of uh, imprisoned people. And then there's Russia. Or, uh, you know, <laughs> I didn't mean it that way. Um, <laughs> but uh, even more, just the statistics, just like the mayor said, there, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, and all of us can help in each and every way that, that we know how uh, and, and that in the areas of our expertise. Uh, 15, only 15% 15 of the population is comprised of African American males. 40% of those African American males make up the prison population. And the women's population is also increasing. Uh, and that leaves a lot of young people, children, without parents or a parent or a caregiver. That puts a lot of them in foster care. I mean, just, and even education, it affects everything. So my, the whole purpose in point of scholarships is to hit it at the root. We still need the advocacy programs, we still need the rehabilitation, but the education piece is also key. So keep listening out for us and look out for us and um, we're, we're growing and I absolutely love my young people and I'm just so honored to be here amongst these women um, who are getting recognized. So thank you so much, have a great evening. Now to present our next award for excellence in leadership is Commissioner I'm sorry, Claudia McCoin. Claudia currently serves as the district's rental housing commission co commissioner, but spent I'm sorry, but spent I'm sorry the majority of her career in governmental affairs. First as the director of public policy and external affairs for, Ver for Verizon Communication then as Director of Federal Relations for the District of Columbia Council. Claudia is semi-retired now and divides her time among a number of community service organizations. We are pleased that she is able to squeeze in a little time for the Commission for Women. Please welcome Commissioner Claudia McCoin. Good evening. Good evening. I know that um, the, for those of you who were here uh, earlier this evening, you saw that Ms. Johns was here and had to leave to catch a flight. But I'm sure that all of you do not know about her background and why we are honoring her tonight as a leader. The Honorable Marie C. Johns, <clears throat> excuse me, has been a leader in business, in the community, and in government service for more than 30 years. From 2010 through June 2013, she served as the Deputy Administrator for the Small Business Administration. She was nominated by President Barack Obama and confirmed unanimously by the U.S. Senate. As Deputy Administrator, she was responsible for the management of the agency and development of SBA programs and policies. One of her initiatives that the SBA supported involved $30 billion in lending for small businesses that supported 60,000 of them. In addition to other duties that Marie had during that time with the SBA, 
She served as chair of the President's Interagency Task Force on Veterans Small Business Development. She also was the force behind Start Young, an SBA and Department of Labor initiative that provides entrepreneurial training to Job Corps students and encourages them to use their technical skills to start a business. Prior to her government service, Marie had senior positions in the telecommunications industry, including serving as president of Verizon Washington. And that's how I know her from our time in telecom together. <laughs> Under Marie's leadership, the company developed and implemented a regulatory plan that eventually served as a model for the corporation. One example of her ongoing efforts to leverage corporate resources for greater community good was the SEEDS program. SEED stands for Students Educated for Economic Development Success. SEEDS prepared high school dropouts to complete their high school requirements, receive technical training for jobs in the telecommunications industry. Over 200 students were eventually hired through that program. Marie is recognized as a leader in the Washington, D.C. community and nationally as a strong advocate for small business. She is a member of the Greater Washington Business Hall of Fame and has been one of Washingtonian Magazine's 100 Most Powerful Women. While being engaged as a business leader, Marie always found time to give back to her community. She was a member of the Board of Trustees of Howard University and chair of its Academic Excellence Committee also serving on the board of the Howard University Hospital and was the first chair of Howard University's Middle School of Mathematics and Science, a public charter school committed to academic excellence that prepared sixth through eighth graders in the STEM disciplines. For many years, Marie has been active with the Girl Scouts, both locally and nationally, having served on the board of Girl Scouts USA. Marie is the recipient of over 100 awards for her community service, and tonight the D.C. Commission for Women is proud and honored to recognize her leadership in our community. And on a note of personal privilege, I just want to say that my chances to work with her over these many years since she came to Washington, both in the community and business professionally, has been an honor, and I can speak of her leadership and her very strong commitment to our community. So on her behalf, her son, who I've known for a while myself, will accept the award on her behalf. And why don't the family kind of come up? <laughs> Richard Johns and the rest of the Johns family. My son um, is adamant to say something on behalf of his grandmother. So I, I will pass the mic to him. So he can say his words. Okay. On behalf of my grandmother, I love her very much, and I feel that she really deserves this leadership award. I am very, very proud of her. Thank you to Mayor Gray, thank you to Ms. Lowry, uh, Ms. Richardson, and the D.C. Commission on Women. Um, I want to congratulate all the awardees and uh, just know we are proud of you and continue excellence. Thank you. Congratulations again to Ms. Marie Johns. And wow, what an incredible uh, resume. And it's, again, one more honor to add to her long list of accolades that she's earned for her leadership in business and in the community. What a great role model for women. This here. Yikes. Next up is, is the award, uh, is the award for another great role model. Here to present the award for workforce development 
is Commissioner Ann, Ann Barnett. Dr. Barnett is a pediatric neurosurgeon, I'm sorry, and Professor Emeritus at George Washington University, at George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Services, and a research fellow in the Institute for Policy Studies. A lifelong advocate for early childhood education, Dr. Burnett founded and serves as honorary chair of The Family Place, a local nonprofit that empowers low-income families with social services and educational support. Please welcome Commissioner Ann Barnett. It's my great honor to present uh, a Women of Excellence Award to Christine Brooks Cropper, who is President and CEO for the DC Fashion Foundation. In this job, she identifies ways to retain and support and, uh, and forward the careers of designers, fashion retailers, and uh, fashion industry professionals. Um, I, she's here with her husband and child, and I think that's a great example of, a, of women of excellence who are doing it all and, um, and are great examples for uh, women in the workforce. And so we're very proud to have her uh, and honor her this uh, evening. Christine spearheaded and now chairs the uh, Commission on Fashion, Arts, and Events in the D.C. government. Um, in 2007, Christine launched the Greater Washington Fashion Chamber of Commerce, and in 2009, the D.C. Fashion Foundation. And through her work uh, at, in these organizations, she's influenced D.C. legislation. She's established youth and adult arts and design education programs. She formed the first Congressional Apparel Manufacturing and Fashion Business Caucus on Capitol Hill. And she served on the Creative Economy Transition Team for Mayor Gray and has coordinated the launch of the 2013 uh, Creative Economy Strategy uh, alongside the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development. And this strategy serves to support creative businesses across the District of Columbia. Christine is currently working with the U.S. Small Business Administration and Macy's Holdings to create the D.C. Fashion Incubator Program at Macy's Metro Center that will assist emerging designers and fashion uh, and small business entrepreneurs. Um, her, her many accomplishments have been lauded in the Wall Street Journal and the Business Journal, Uptown, the Washingtonian, uh, and uh, Women's Wear Daily. And uh, she has just, is helping the district forward opportunities uh, and become a fashion center. And it's really my great pleasure to present Christine Brooks Cropper with the Washington Women of Excellence Award for Workforce Development. Well, I thank you for this honor from Mayor Gray, Teresa, the commissioners, Nona, thank you so much for this. This is a huge, um, sometimes you, you just do your work and you don't really stop to breathe to say what it, exactly that impact is. And this is when you actually get that time to breathe and say, well, my work is actually, I'm, I'm doing something great here. Um, I am a little under the weather, as you can hear, and that's due to that little one. So, you know, when your wife and mom an entrepreneur and starting everything and just fighting the good fight, um, you tend to kind of forget about taking care of yourself. Um, so I definitely just want to briefly say one, thank you to Mayor Gray because 
He was the chairman of city council when I came back to Washington, D.C., because I used to work for Mayor Anthony Williams. And I helped create the Office for Victim Services here. And there I dealt with women's issues, violence against women and victims of crime. And during that time, I owned my own fashion production company, and I used to produce the Congressional Black Caucus Fashion Show, which I'm sure a lot in the room remember those good old days that we lived for the Congressional Black Caucus Fashion Show, <laughs> the Midnight and Brunch Show. And a lot of people still talk about it to this day, and we would like to kind of um, you know, bring that back to Washington, D.C. But Mayor Gray was the chairman um, of city council, and we brought this piece of legislation forth to create the Commission on Fashion Arts and Events. And when we came back and said, this fashion is an asset to economic development, workforce development, we're going to put people back to work. We're going to work with young people um, to create scholarships and internships and bring vocational skills back to the schools. They said, no, that cannot happen. So I definitely want to say thank you to Mayor Gray for believing in me and definitely when you have a passion or you have a dream, to push and be very persistent. When they close that door in your face, you know, you just got to go through it, over it, under it, however you're going to get around to get that message across, to definitely pursue that. And that's what we did. And here today, I'm now the chairperson of that commission for fashion arts and events. And I have some of the commissioners in the room, Elida Sanchez is here joining me, as well as my team and my board members, because along that way, we created a chamber of commerce. A lot of people said you can't create a chamber of commerce. It's DC chamber, it's the Hispanic chamber, or the African American chamber of commerce, but you don't do fashion chamber of commerce. It's an industry chamber of commerce. But we did do that, and we got recognized by the US Chamber of Commerce and the American Chamber of Commerce for CEOs. I was recognized by them as the first specialty chamber of commerce in the United States. Um, so we also took that a step further to say, okay, how can we change policy and legislation? Because we want to get back to basics, the basics of putting people back to work. And that, as you all know, 100 years ago, creating the Garment District in New York, we can definitely put people back to work here in Washington, D.C. through apparel manufacturing and the Washington, D.C. Fashion Foundation as well as the commission and the commissioners are going to work very hard to do that. And we're hoping that our goal is putting about 10,000 people back to work in the next 10 years. So I thank you so much for this honor. And I am definitely am just grateful to just be here today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Christine, and congratulations for your success in laying the foundation for the fashion industry in the district. The next award will be presented by Commissioner and Vice Chair Ann Garcia. Okay, let me get this out of the way. Ann has worked tire tirelessly for nearly a decade in providing case management and therapy to survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking. Ann currently serves as social services manager at La Clinica del Pueblo, vice chair of the Commission for Women, and chair for the district's Commission on Latino Community Development. Please welcome Commissioner and Vice Chair Ann Garcia. Thank you, Nona. Becky Lee is a leader and catalyst for change in the fight against domestic violence and the driving force behind Becky's Fund, a cutting edge nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C. that instigates social transformation and provides public service to the battered and abused. Becky first became aware of the tragedies of domestic violence in her junior year at the University of Michigan when she heard a lecture by an attorney who specialized in acquitting battered women imprisoned for killing their abusers in self-defense. The impact of this lecture on Becky resulted in her dedicating her life and her career to addressing the social, cultural, and legal barriers that entrap domestic violence victims. Becky received her bachelor's in women's study from the University of Michigan and then continued on to receive her Juris Doctorate degree from the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. In 2006, Becky participated in NBC's Survivor and used a portion of her winnings as second runner-up to launch the domestic violence awareness nonprofit that she still runs today. An avid competitive sports and football enthusiast, Becky worked as a kickboxing instructor for over six years with a focus on helping battered women regain their confidence and self-esteem through their, her classes. <laughs> Becky has toured the country building programs, running workshops, giving lectures and launching training sessions to raise awareness, encourage advocacy, prevent domestic violence, and create support for individuals and families. 
suffering from intimate partner violence. To date, Becky's work with men and boys through Men of Code has been praised by Vice President Joe Biden and the White House, and her work has been featured in the Huffington Post, the Washington Business Journal, Politico, Washington Life Magazine, WUSA 9, and NBC Washington. And now we feature her work here by presenting Becky Lee with the Washington Women of Excellence Award for Public Safety. So good evening, everyone. Um, it's obviously an honor, such an honor to be here tonight, and I thank you, obviously Mayor Gray, as well as the DC Commission for Women um, for this recognition. Um, I also like to thank several board members and volunteers in this room because we know that the work we do at Becky's Fund, we can't do alone. Um, at Becky's Fund, as, as um, was discussed, we work on several different programs, really engaging people from all different backgrounds. Um, we work with both young men and women, as young as nine years old. We work with athletes and coaches. We work with students, college students all over the country, as well as adults, and then also working in direct advocacy for survivors of intimate partner violence. Collaboration is huge. You know, we've been working with um, different domestic violence organizations, such as DC Coalition Against Domestic Violence, and also really creating awareness in the public about what your rights are and how you can get help, but also how you can help someone in need. Um, but really getting the community mobilized behind this one message saying that there is hope available, there is safety, uh, it, it, all you have to do is really reach out for this help. Um, you know, the statistics show that one in four women in the United States is affected by intimate partner violence and that three women are murdered every day by their abusive partners. So we know that this work, there's a lot of work to do, right? However, this recognition of this issue um, is really catching a lot more, you know, support, obviously from the Vice President up top at the White House, as well as we have a lot of celebrities and community leaders, also the people in this room talking about this issue, giving people the hope that there is a way out. And you know, stopping that perspective, asking that question, why doesn't he or she leave? Instead of blaming the survivor, but creating accountability for the abuser, asking why does this crime continue? So again, I thank you so much for this honor and this recognition, and also the support for the work that Becky's Fund has been doing over the last seven years. Thank you. so much, Becky, for all your incredible work. We, we, we're really proud of you and appreciate what you do. Our next award will be presented by Commissioner Dr. Wilma Bonner. Dr. Bonner is the Director of Teacher Education at, at Howard University and the former Assistant Superintendent uh, and Executive Director of Academic Programs for the District of Columbia Public Schools. In other words, she is a teacher extraordinaire. Dr. Bonner brings balance and wisdom to the commission and we are honored to work with her. Please welcome Dr. Wilma Bonner. Thank you very much for your very generous introduction, Nona. I have the distinct honor of telling the story of a phenomenal Washington woman who is no longer with us physically, but who is nonetheless very worthy of a path posthumous honor and whose legacy lives on in a school named in her honor. Dr. Euphemia Lofton Haynes, a fourth generation Washingtonian, was a trailblazer and very important contributor to Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C.'s history and Washington, D.C.'s educational le legacy. She was the first African-American woman to earn a PhD in mathematics. Dr. Long Lofton had a distinguished career as a high school teacher, a college professor, and president of the District of Columbia Board of Education. She was born Martha Euphenia Lofton in 1890 to her father, Dr. William S. Lofton, a prominent District of Columbia financier and de dentist, and a mother, Lavinia de Lofton, who was an active member of the Catholic Church. She graduated high school from Washington's Minor Normal School in 1909, where in fact my office is currently located. Four years later, 
She received a Bachelor's of Arts degree in mathematics, minoring in psychology. In 1917, she married Harold Apo Haynes, who later became a principal and deputy superintendent in charge of Washington's colored schools. In 1930, Dr. Haynes received a master's degree in education from the University of Chicago, where she also did further graduate study in mathematics. She earned a doctorate degree in mathematics from Catholic University. Dr. Haynes taught in the public schools of the District of Columbia for 47 years and was the first woman to chair the District of Columbia School Board. She was a teacher of first grade at Garrison and Garfield schools, a teacher of mathematics at Armstrong High School, an English teacher at Minor Normal School. She taught mathematics and served as a chair of mathematics department at Dunbar. She was a professor of mathematics at Minor's Teachers College. In fact, she established a mathematics department. And she was also a professor at the District of Columbia Teachers College, for which she served as the chair of both mathematics and business education. After her 1959 retirement from public schools, she was head of the city's board of education and was central to the integration of the District of Columbia Public Schools. Dr. Haynes was an active member in many community activities. She served as the first vice president of the Archdiocesan Council of Catholic Women she was a chairman of the advisory board of Fetus Neighborhood House. She was on the Committee of International Social Welfare. She was on the executive committee of the National Social Wel Welfare Assembly. She was a secretary and member of the executive committee of the DC Health and Welfare Council. She served on the local national committee of the United States Service Organization and as a member of the National Conference of Christians and Jews Catholic International Council of Washington and Urban League. She served in the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. She was a member of the League of Women Voters and the American Association of University Women, would you believe? Dr. Euphemia Lofton Haynes was awarded the Papal Medal from the Catholic Church in 1959. Not only was she a very, very dedicated woman, very busy woman, very active woman, but she was also a very generous woman. Upon her death in 1980, she bequeathed $700,000 to Catholic University in a trust fund, which was used to establish a professional chair and student loan fund in the School of Education. Though Dr. Haynes directly impacted the lives of many, many children during her lifetime, she and her husband had no children of their own. Yet today, hundreds, and I dare say in the years to come, thousands of Washington children will know her name and they will know who she was. They will know her story. Tonight, we have Miss Jenny Niles, who is the founder of the Washington's most sought after public charter school. She learned of Dr. Haynes' history and named a school in her honor. How wise, how very kind, how, how very respectful. Ms. Niles. This is, this is such an incredible honor. Uh, thank you, Mayor Gray. Thank you to the commission. Um, and for those, uh, it was wonderful to hear about Dr. Haynes. Um, I have the good fortune of having made one smart decision, which was to name the school after this remarkable woman. Uh, and in fact, as you could tell from um, hearing about her history, um, it l makes a very high bar for us to live up to, to truly honor all that she's done. So um, our school is called E.L. Haynes public charter school. We have 1,100 students and three years old through 11th grade. Next year we'll have 
1,200 students through 12th grade. Yes, you're all invited to graduation. Um, <laughs> And, um, and there are a couple things about her life that we want to honor at the school in particular. Um, our, our promise is be kind, work hard, get smart. And I think that you could tell by her resume that she lived that and embodied that um, as well as anybody could imagine. Um, the be kind part, her sense of community and her sense of duty um, and care and love to um, those outside her um, immediate family was just remarkable. I had the amazing good luck. We were, I told this brief story. Um, I ran into one of my high school teachers uh, and who I hadn't seen for a long time and I said that I was starting a school named E.L. Haynes and she said, why do you say that? And it turns out that my high school teacher is now the DC Poet Laureate, uh, Dolores Kendrick. And so uh, I said, Miss Kendrick, because I don't call her Dolores still to this day, um, uh, I said, because it's after Dr. Euphemia Lofton Haynes, she said, I know. She was my mentor. She was my teacher in high school. She was my mentor through college. She's why I got a master's, and she's why I teach. And so uh, we had an opening to our building um, six years ago, and it was Miss Kendrick that came and read a poem that she dedicated to Dr. Haynes and told us stories. I say that to um, that kind of connection with Dr. Haynes continues to come up over and over again, and our students are blessed by knowing about her and having that incredibly um, high bar to reach themselves in being kind, working hard, and getting smart. The last thing I'll mention is um, she got her doctorate when she was in her 50s. Just some inspiration <laughs> for all of us. Uh, but thank you, and this is truly an honor. I can't wait to show the kids because they sometimes they think my last name is Haynes. So this, uh, but they've seen pictures, and now this will really help them understand. So thank you. <laughs> Next on the program is Commissioner Jill Morrison, who will present the award for public health. Jill is a professor at the Georgetown University Law School and executive director of two very important programs at the center, the Women's Law and Public Policy Fellowship Program and the Leadership and Advocacy for Women in Africa Program. Jill previously worked at the National Women's Law Center and has practiced as an attorney and advocate in the field of reproductive rights for over a decade. Please welcome Commissioner Jill Morrison. Thank you. In 1995, a volunteer with a local rape crisis center was working with a survivor who learned she was pregnant. That survivor wanted to get an abortion, and in an effort to raise quick funds for the woman, this social worker emailed her entire address book and asked for money. She raised enough for both the procedure for the rape survivor and then had some leftover resources. When she asked everyone who had donated what she should do with the extra money, they told her to save it for the next time. Thus, the DC Abortion Fund began. So by 2005, the call volume to what had become a very informal hotline had increased such that um, they had to get more organized to grow, uh, to grow and meet the demand. So a group of committed volunteers formerly established the DC Abortion Fund, which is now lovingly referred to as DCAF. The fund makes grants to women and girls who cannot afford the full cost of an abortion. It's the only organization in the region that focuses solely on providing the service to women, not only in our own community, but also in those from other areas who are seeking services here. When the commission began talking about honoring um, DC women, DCAF was number one on my list. And that's not just because, as you heard, I spent many, many years as a reproductive rights advocate. While there are abortion funds across the nation, DCAF is one of a kind. Because of our unique status, mentioned by the mayor, the lack of abortion funding does not represent the will of DC residents, does not represent the will of our elected officials, or even our appointed judges. Our community supports the autonomy of women as much as it supports the autonomy of DC's government. So for me, supporting DCAF is an act of democratic defiance, and that's democratic with a small d. 
DCAF uh, now has a board that supervises case managers who staff the helpline and raise money for the grants to women in need. The board of directors is, jo is joined by their highly dedicated volunteers, um, 23 case managers, a pro bono attorney, an accountant, a graphic designer, and a few great bloggers. I know there are many DCAF staffers in the room tonight. Can you please just give me a shout out? So I heard Val speak the other night, um, and she said something that was really profound, and that's that when women are calling the DC Abortion Fund, they're at a moment of triple vulnerability. Number one, they're calling to ask someone for money. Number two, they're calling a stranger. And number three, they're calling for the purpose of obtaining what has com come to be one of the most stigmatized procedures in the world. You can only imagine the type of people that are staffing this hotline and the type of stories that they hear day in and day out about the reality of women's lives. The hard work of all of these dedicated, passionate individuals have earned DCAF the Washington Women of Excellence Award for Public Health. Now the term rock star is overused, but I believe she's taken DCAF to new heights since becoming the board president in 2011. So accepting the award on behalf of DCAF is Val Vallott. You know, it's tough to go after Jill because I feel like we always get into this cycle where I'm like, no, you're a rock star. Um, Jill's one of our kind of longest serving and um, most incredible supporters. So I have to thank her as well as the DC Commission for Women um, and the Mayor's Office for this award, which again, I'm accepting not as an individual, but on behalf of a whole complement of amazing supporters, um, many of whom are in the back right here. Um, I could talk about decaf for a really long time, but I want to just give you all a glimpse, if you'll oblige me for a second, about the work that we do and the reason that this award is so important. Um, we get over 200, uh, 2,500 calls a year from women in the DC metro area who need help paying, as Jill said, for the most stigmatized procedure in the country. They call a stranger, they ask for help, and many of them have had, um, to say false starts would be putting it lightly, getting help anywhere else. Our brave and super amazing uh, team of volunteers accepts those calls and does everything that they can to help these women as much as possible. And that goes anywhere from referring them to respectable clinics, helping them with some financial resource counseling, and ultimately actually offering money on their behalf to a clinic to help fund abortion care. Um, this work is significant uh, to the tune of about $130,000 that was given out last year. And I would be remiss if I did not say that over 70% of the funds that we get come from individuals just like you. Um, and so we're incredibly grateful to have the support of a community to allow us to keep doing exactly that kind of work. I should also say that DC is really fortunate in a lot of ways in the reproductive rights sphere. We have clinics here, we have amazing providers, and so what that creates is that for women of means, choice is a reality. You can go to a clinic, you don't have to drive for days, you can get a procedure and go home. But those aren't the women that we're dealing with. We're dealing with women who are extraordinarily low income, who are um, caught up in safety net programs as it is and struggling to support their families already. And for them, you know, the $400 or so that's required for an abortion here in DC is absolutely out of the question, at least out of the question if they don't want to jeopardize the lives of their fam existing families. Um, and so it's important to note, as Mayor Gray and Jill both indicated, that there's a really clear and super tragic reason for this inequality. And that is that the District of Columbia has discriminatory policies that are imposed upon it, not by our local government, but by the US Congress. And that is a tragedy. It's heartbreaking every time we pick up the phone 
that we have to listen to the stories of these women for whom Congress considers them a bargaining chip and nothing more. Their lived experiences are just a political bargaining chip and that's wrong. I would also offer that tonight then it comes into stark relief that we're here and we're accepting this award because we are so lucky and so fortunate here in the district that our local government, the mayor's office, the city council, the commission, are incredibly supportive of our work. They believe that unequal access to abortion is a public health issue, that it's an issue of human rights. Um, and because we have those tremendous allies, unlike many of our peers around the country who do very similar work, DCAF benefits from the support of a community that allows us to do this work at a higher level to not have to tell women who call us for help, no, we don't have enough money to help you. Um, this award really to me symbolizes that commitment from, the local, from our local officials here in DC, a symbol that despite the fact that many would say that the work that we do is contentious or politically charged and would shy away from it, the mayor's office and this government here understand that it is absolutely critical to fight for autonomy at every turn, and that means budget autonomy, and it means bodily autonomy for the women that live right here. Um, finally, I would just say that on behalf of myself and the dozens of volunteers that work with DCAF day in and day out, um, the support of the Office of Women's Policy and the mayor's office, both in this award and their fearless leadership year round up on the hill and here in the community is absolutely incredible. And if I had an award, I would give it to you all. So thank you so much. I don't think it was mentioned that Val and her team do this tireless work as volunteers, which I think deserves its own acknowledgement. So we have Commissioner Nikki Charles, who serves as the chair of this evening's event. She's worked very, very hard to make this all come together. We really appreciate all of her effort. She, Therese, Lisa, and the planning committee members have brought us all here for this event. And she gets, to get, she gets the special privilege of presenting the induction of our very special honoree to the DC Commission for Women's Hall of Fame. Nikki is a native Washingtonian. She is currently a marketing ex executive in the adult beverage indus uh, distribution industry. She is also an entrepreneur and an enthusiastic supporter of the city's emerging fashion industry. Please welcome Commissioner Nikki Charles. Thank you, Nona. I feel very honored to chair the inaugural Women, Washington Women of Excellence Awards and to celebrate the most treasured, one of the most treasured women here this evening, Mrs. Virginia McLaurin, who are honored to induct into the DC Commission for Women's Hall of Fame. But first, I should share a little history of, Wash of the Women's History Month, I'm sorry. Um, in 1978, a group of 100 women gathered in Santa Rosa, California to celebrate the contributions of women in history and contemporary society. After the success of the community's week-long celebration, a movement quickly grew throughout the country and then internationally celebrating women's accomplishments throughout history and turning the celebration into International Women's History Month. I'm sure it's no coincidence that our commission was created the same year that Women's History Month was established in California. To date, 23 women have been inducted to the DC Commission of Women's Hall of Fame. The portraits of some of these great leaders and contributors are dis displayed throughout the reception space for you to appreciate. Today we continue the tradition of honoring women and inducting a Washington woman to who, who sets a very high bar for us all. Let me tell you the story of Miss Virginia McLaurin. Virginia McLaurin was the seventh out of 12 children born in Chira, South Carolina on March 12, 1909 to the proud parents of Flora, Ella, and Oliver. At the age of 12, Miss McLaurin's family moved to Raleigh, North Carolina. At the age of 14, 
she married Marshall McLaurin and moved to Hamlet where they far farmed cotton. To this union, two children were born, Ida May and Willie Marshall. In 1940, after the passing of her husband Marshall, Virginia moved her family to Washington, D.C. to be with her sister, where she worked as a seamstress for Gallagher Laundry for over 17 years. As a lifelong caregiver, helping disadvantaged and mistreated children was always important to Ms. McLaurin. This passion led, to her, led her to service as a foster grandparent to Felipe Cardoza. Through this role, Ms. McLaurin became active with Sharp Health School, where she has continu continuously engaged with children as a volunteer for the past 21 years. Some women prefer not to have their age mentioned in public. We think it's worth mentioning, and we don't think she'll mind if we share that today is Ms. McLaurin's 105th birthday. This in its own merit is worth celebrating. I think we all agree with that. The fact that Ms. McLaurin is a vibrant, active woman who has touched the lives of hundreds of DC children and continues to enjoy serving her community is worth a special honor. She inspires us all to take a good care of ourselves so that we can live a long, meaningful, impactful life. Tonight, we celebrate Ms. McLaurin's longstanding commitment and service to the District of Columbia, the 105th birthday, and induct her to the DC Commission for Women's Hall of Fame. All of the ten boys with me, I really appreciate them because they hope we got where I am now. I want to thank the mayor. I want to thank each and every one in here. I love everybody. And I want to thank y'all for letting me work. They don't send me back home. <laughs> <laughs> they said, go ahead, Grandma, and work. So I have so many grandkids, and I appreciate everything you do. And I love you, Mel, for keeping me here. I just so sorry that we don't have sharp health school anymore because I don't know where I'd go in Baltimore. I don't know where I'd go. So I, <laughs> I'm still sorry about that. Well, we're not finished. We have something else special for you. So I'm going to make way for Mayor Gray. All right, in honor of Ms. McLaurin's uh, 105th birthday, uh, I'm proud as the mayor of the District of Columbia to declare today Virginia McLaurin Day in Washington, D.C.